Hello everyone, welcome to the latest webinar from our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program in Strengthening Health Systems, brought to you by the McMaster Health Forum at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. For today's webinar, I'll provide you with a little bit of information on the McMaster Health Forum, the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, and the current version of the scholarship that's offered here at the Forum. I'll then turn things over to our incoming scholar presenter, who's Luca. He's visiting us from Australia, and he's going to be talking about the work that he's been doing on workplace health promotion. Here at the McMaster Health Forum, we aim to be the leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. We harness information, convene stakeholders, and prepare action-oriented leaders. We act as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The current Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between the Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and individual Canadian universities. The purpose of the scholarship program is to activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery, inquiry, and professional experiences. The current version of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program that's offered here at the McMaster Health Forum is called Strengthening Health Systems. Our scholars will contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. The Forum's current QES program has had three cohorts of students. The first cohort, and you can see on the screen here, comprised students who mainly went away or visited us in the calendar year of 2016. Our second cohort of scholars, which comprised 22 students, primarily engaged in their scholarship in the calendar year of 2017. The third and final cohort of the current version of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program here at the McMaster Health Forum primarily went away or visited us in the calendar year of 2018. Today's presenter comes from the large group of incoming scholars who worked with us in the spring and summer of 2018. Today's incoming scholar presenter is Luca, who's completing a Master of Public Health at the University of Sydney. He's interested in the nexus between occupational health and public health, and the idea that health systems operate and must intersect at the micro, meso, and macro levels. Luca will use his health systems knowledge and research skills to collaboratively and transparently formulate solutions to complex health systems problems locally and abroad. Everyone, please say hello to Luca. Thank you, James. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Luca Campbell, and I'm a Master of Public Health student at the University of Sydney and a Queen Elizabeth Scholarship recipient in strengthening health systems. So over the last three weeks, I've been taking part in a program here at the McMaster Health Forum in Hamilton, Ontario. And this has been a fantastic experience where I've had the opportunity to engage with other Queen Elizabeth scholars and learn about finding and using health system evidence in policy decision making and developing policy using an evidence informed framework. Um, I just need to acknowledge that I received a financial scholarship from the Canadian Queen Elizabeth um, Diamond Jubilee Scholarship in Strengthening Health Systems. Um, the scholarship is administered by the McMaster Health Forum and Universities Canada on behalf of the Rideau uh, Hall Foundation. Um, however, McMaster Health Forum, Universities, uh, Universities Canada and the Rideau Hall Foundation didn't have input in the content of this presentation, apart from the reference material, obviously. So firstly, I'd just like to give you a brief overview of the topics I plan to address in my presentation today. I'll start by setting the scene with a few brief reflections on Australia's healthcare system. I'll then go on to analyse uh, a particular component of the system in a particular pop, um, patient population group, um, drawing from Professor John Lavis's model for finding and using research evidence. I'll, I'll describe the problem, identify how it came to attention and discuss the magnitude of the problem before going on to discuss different policy approaches which are sourced from the grey literature. I'll then present my findings from the scientific literature to, fr to frame the problem in terms of stakeholder motivations and possible benefits, harms and costs. So I wanted to start with a brief digression um, and show you this satellite photo of the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, I wanted to show you this because I think it serves as a really good metaphor for Australia's health system. 
So Royal Melbourne is a well-established and highly credible hospital. Um, it's one of the major tertiary care hospitals in the Greater Melbourne area and it attracts some of the brightest minds from the nearby University of Melbourne Parkville campus. It's recently undertaken a renovation of its front entrance um, and it looks quite remarkable from the front of the building. I'll try and point it out if I can. Well, that, that won't show up on the video, but this is the front entrance way here. When you look a little deeper at the blueprint of the hospital, you can see that all of the wings have been tacked on to the original structure. Um, and this has happened over a long period of time in accordance with the, the needs of the hospital to cater to additional technologies, medical specialties, different outpatient and inpatient wards and ambulatory care. The issue is that the hospital has become a maze for patients to navigate. Um, offering, offer, often requiring them to find their way through various wards, passageways, elevators, even tunnels, um, sky bridges or, or roads to get to their destination. So just building on this metaphor, it's often said that the backbone of Australia's health system is our Medicare system, which includes the pharmaceutical benefits schedule and the, med uh, the medical benefits schedule. So in this sense, it's analogous to the core bargain here in Ontario that much of the remaining health system is structured around. So over the years since Medicare was introduced, there have been a number of additions to the healthcare sector, um, sorry, the healthcare system, which has helped to extend coverage of the system to specific population groups, be it due to po um, policy legacy issues, recommendations or shifting community views. While this probably makes for a better system as a whole, the fragmentation of the system makes it difficult for patients to navigate, just like it's become difficult to get from one ward of the Royal Melbourne Hospital to another. The other problem with the iterative scope um, of changes to Australia's health system is that it sometimes inadvertently and sometimes intentionally leaves gaps behind. I've illustrated this with the, the black shapes on the screen here. So the gaps might be caused by a number of reasons, including institutional factors such as government structures and policy legacy, or the influence of interest groups in the policy development process. It is also a reality of the fact that many of Australia's policies, uh, Australia's policies related to healthcare require negotiation between two levels of government within our federation, the state and the commonwealth. This causes friction and can also cause um, heterogeneity in the health system coverage and quality between the states. So with all of that in mind, I would now like to move on to a particular component of Australia's healthcare system, and that is the component that addresses the health needs of workers. My central argument is that injuries and illnesses in the work, working population are relatively common, and yet health promotion and injury and disease prevention in the workplace has failed to attract sufficient attention from health, health policy makers. Consequently, co consequently, the workplace represents a missed opportunity for health promotion. So why is this a problem? So we'll start by looking at the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. In 1986, the WHO produced the Ottawa Charter, to which WHO signatories agreed including Australia. One of the five key action areas of this charter was building healthy public policy, which is the outer circle on the diagram. This action area identifies that health promotion goes beyond healthcare. It puts health on the agenda of policymakers in all sectors and at all levels, directing them to be aware of the health consequences of their decisions and to accept their responsibilities for health. There are three key strategies for health promotion described in the Charter, advocate, enable and mediate, and they are the arms on the diagram on the screen. The mediate strategy identifies that health promotion cannot be achieved by the health sector alone, rather its success will depend on the collaboration of all sectors of government as well as independent organisations. So the WHO performed a survey in 2008, finding that less than half of surveyed countries have endorsed or drafted a national plan of action on workers' health. Only a small proportion of the global work workforce has 
access to occupational health services for, for primary prevention and control of diseases and injuries caused or aggravated by work. While work, workers' health is often incorporated into health promotion, injury prevention and HIV programs, it is rarely found in programs dealing with cancer, malaria and family health. This quote is taken from the WHO Health Systems in Transition um, document um, focusing on Australia. And the author comments that a central challenge for policymakers is how to best how best to manage the increasing burden of chronic disease and the, and the health needs of the ageing population. This requires more emphasis on health promotion and efforts to reduce health risk factors, intervening earlier with conditions that are am amenable to treatment, better coordination, uh, uh, sorry, better coordinated management of chronic disease and more emphasis on cost effective care. So I have some statistics here um, which are published by the National Workplace Health and Safety Regulator in Australia called Safe Work Australia. Um, just a, in relation to the frequency and cost of um, work-related injuries. So in Australia, the cost of work-related injury and disease to the Australian economy is estimated at $61.8 billion Australian per year. 77% um, of the work-related injuries and disease costs are borne by the workers themselves. And the proportion of serious claims in the 55 plus age group has increased in a linear fashion since 2001, which is in line with Australia's ageing workforce. So I did a, this desktop analysis to just compare Australia's approach um, com compared to some other um, developed countries. Um, Apologise for the busy slide, um, but the main point I wanted to highlight here was the position of work, workers' um, health um, in the respective countries and um, how that sort of is incorporated into the broader um, health systems mix. Um, so I've summarised um, the main financing and delivery components, so financing on the left column, delivery on the right, um, for Australia, Canada, Finland and the United States. Um, the data is somewhat dated, but I wanted to make sure that I've um, looked to the same source and been consistent in the data despite it, um, despite it probably being a little bit outdated. Um, so all four of the countries I looked at have systems for financing um, workers' compensation schemes, which you can see in the bold um, on the left column. However, Finland was the only country which, um, in which employers are actively involved in the delivery of care in the employment setting, and, and this is facilitated through occupational um, health centres. So I wanted to just drill a little bit more into Finland to discuss how their system works. Um, so employers in Finland are legally obliged to provide preventative health services to employees financed partly by cost rebates through the National Insurance Scheme, which is um, SII um, on the diagram here. The larger um, employers supplement this with primary care as well, and in fact 30% of all out outpatient visits in Finland are provided in the occupational um, setting. So you can see those red, um, the boxes that I've highlighted red on this slide um, are the three, I guess, delivery components of Finland's health system with um, obviously some, um, I guess, um, agencies underneath that also providing delivery, but they're, I guess, the three main um, agents that oversee the delivery of healthcare and employers is considered an integral um, part of that in, in addition to private providers and the uh, municipal governments. So after defining and quantifying the problem, I then went on to frame the problem by considering the financial governance and delivery arrangements that might be contributors to it. So this was a brainstorming step um, and it helped me to structure my thinking and refine the search filters to be applied in the health systems evidence database. So under financial um, arrangements, I thought that employers might be constrained by budgets and maybe focused on delivering profits or other business objectives. And this is an example of purchasing products or services category in the finding and using um, evidence taxonomy, taxonomy developed by the Master Health Forum. 
I also thought that employers may fail to see the value in promoting health amongst employees, especially when upfront costs are high. And this is an example of um, the incentivising customers, uh, so, uh, sorry, incentivising consumers um, category. <coughs> Under governance arrangements, I thought that legislative, legislative instruments may be absent or inadequate, and the responsibilities of the state and private enterprise may be fragmented or unclear. And this is an example of a policy authority issue. Um, similarly, um, employers may have insufficient incentives to promote health and consequently insufficient disincentives to expose workers to disease-causing agents. And this is an issue that could be addressed by policy and regulatory measures. Um, and under delivery arrangements, um, I thought that the non-health sector might not have the capacity in terms of knowledge or skills to promote health in the workplace. Um, which is an example of a skills mix um, issue. So after framing the problem, I then sought to find evidence um, to, uh, to frame the rest of um, my approach. Um, so the three questions I asked at this point were what evidence is available to support the effectiveness um, of various policy options available to address the health system needs of workers, what are the potential benefits and harms of the policy options? And what are the local costs and cost effectiveness considerations? So I searched two databases. Firstly, the PubMed database, database which I, um, in which I applied the um, Health Systems Research Hedge and limited to outcomes assessment. Um, and I also searched health system evidence limiting to systematic reviews of effects. Um, so firstly, to do, just to look at the effectiveness of workplace health promotion, um, this article, this systematic review by Jacobs and others, um, published in um, the um, in Occupational Medicine, um, showed that there were potential savings. Sorry, this is um, actually about the cost cost effectiveness. Um, the potential savings generated from workplace wellness programs tended to come from productivity changes. Um, it also highlighted that cost savings from health um, care utilisation were less consistent um, and suggest that ro more robust analyses are, are required. Um, in terms of the benefits and I guess the efficacy of um, workplace health promotion initiatives, um, so this systematic review um, by um, Rongen and colleagues um, was published in 2013. Um, the AMSTAR rating was 5.9, which has been um, indexed by the McMaster Health Forum. Um, importantly, um, Finland um, and Australia and the United States were included um, in, uh, as um, individual studies in this systematic review. Um, however, the quality rating suggests that um, some more robust research might be needed. Um, a more robust systematic review might be needed in order to sort of readdress this question. Um, the main outcomes observed here were 23% um, improvement in um, self-perceived health, of, so that's the employee's view of their own um, health status, 21% um, decrease in sickness absences, 29% increase in work productivity, and 23% increase in work ability. Um, that last finding was not significant. The other three were, but as you can see, the confidence intervals are still quite wide. Um, in terms of considering stakeholder motivations, um, this study by uh, Rojat and others um, published just last year had an excellent um, review of the qualitative factors, um, identified behaviours and, uh, sorry, um, barriers and facilitators at the organisation um, participant and implementer <coughs> level. Unfortunately, the AMSTAR rating for this study was um, still sort of in the moderate range at five. So in conclusion, um, health systems have adopted different approaches to promoting health amongst workers. Some systems have financed specific worker health um, Finance specific worker health needs only, for example, workers' compensation schemes. At least one health system, which is Finland, has financed and, deli and delivered health promotion and primary care in the occupational setting. 
There's some evidence to suggest that workplace health promotion programs are effective in imp improving the health of workers. However, further systematic reviews are required to substantiate these findings using, using a more rigorous and robust me methodology. Factors at the organisation participant and implementer level um, may act as barriers or facilitators to suggest, uh, sorry, to the success of workplace health promotion initiatives. However, more research is needed to examine occupational health as a component of the broader health system arrangements. So once developed, any policy recommendations should be considered in the context of the broader health, social and political systems by way of a local applicability assessment. So before I finish up, I would just like to acknowledge and express my gratitude to the McMaster Health Forum um, faculty and staff and to the other um, Queen Elizabeth scholars here. The experience at McMaster has been overwhelmingly positive for me, um, surprisingly practical and um, truly inspirational. Um, it, it really act as a acted as a catalyst for me to start considering my own PhD work, um, which I know would give me greater um, knowledge and skills in applying the methods in health systems evidence and policy analysis, and hopefully allow me to make a, a positive impact. So thank you for your time. For those of you who are able to make it here today to watch the presentation in person, I want to thank you for coming out. For those of you that have uh, watched the video later on on YouTube, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, before we leave you today, I just want to take a minute to go over a couple of the links that are on the screen to provide you with additional information about our program and what our scholars have been doing. Uh, if you're interested in the forum's Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, either the current program which is ending in 2018 or the new program which is actually being launched in mid to late 2018 I would encourage you to please click that first link that will take you to the information page at our the McMaster Health Forum's website and t tell you all the information you need to know about our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program in terms of how to apply and how to be involved. If you're interested in other presentations and webinars by our Queen Elizabeth Scholars, I would encourage you to click on that second link. There you'll find all of the current webinars uh, that have been done by all of our Queen Elizabeth Scholars and future webinars uh, that our scholars will be doing will also be posted there. And thirdly, you'll see that there is a link for our scholars blog page, which is machealthformscholars.com. Our scholars write blogs about personal reflections about their experiences while abroad or when they visited Canada if they were an international scholar. So please uh, visit that page and read some of the blogs that our scholars have posted. Feel free to follow us on Twitter at MacHealthForum and please follow the hashtag QBScholars so you can see all of the fun and exciting things that scholars have been doing from multiple universities around Canada. Thank you for joining us and we'll hope to see you again soon.